We're here to collect some money from you. That means we need your help. We're not playing. Put that basket out there. Get that money. Give that money, baby. Give that money. Come on, girls. You do what I do. Hey, get up off of that thing and dance till you feel better. Get up off of that thing. Just try to release that pressure. Joe, so, a deer, a female deer. Ray, a drop of golden sun. Me, a name I call myself. Far, a long, long way to run. Many people think they know what nuns and sisters are like. The image portrayed by the media often shows these eccentric religious women dressed in habits, taking their town by storm, and evidently they can fly. However, the stereotypes formed by these ideals are not always accurate for modern sisters. I do think um, over time, uh, the way in which sisters have been um, uh, maybe projected as um, mean, um, unhappy. The media has, um, especially in terms of filming, made us look like ditzes. <laughs> um, stories like The Flying Nun that were on TV, or even the sisters in Sister Act, uh, many of them were projected as pretty ridiculous. We're not all beautiful, gorgeous women. You know, we're not all as bold as uh, Sound of Music. With me being the youngest in community right now, and I'm finding out in the general public is they're not visioning someone in her young 40s as a religious woman. And they're envisioning someone in her 60s or 70s. So just because there are fewer of us at this age, so they just don't have as much experience and then I think too when they wore the habit you really couldn't tell how old they were so it was always mystery <laughs> under that veil. Well I remember when Oprah had the Habited Sisters on her show and um, their portrayal and experience as a religious is much different than mine and if Oprah was really worth her salt she'd have had both sides that there's more than but that left you with the image that we're all like that. The reality is, I, I think that we have been um, maybe shortchanged a little. The misconception that all sisters wear habits comes from before Vatican II, when all sisters were required to dress in that style. Vatican II was a council that changed the direction of the church to be more involved with the local community. One of the changes brought on by this was allowing sisters to dress in the style of the community that they work in. While most sisters made the change to modern attire, some religious groups still follow that tradition. I will say there are a different Catholic sisters in the country that have, do wear habit, and that's how they uh, feel is the best way for them to live out their religious vocation. I, that's fine. I have nothing against that. That's We went back to the to what our founder, St. Benedict, indicated, and it's pretty much wear the dress of the day. There were many more sisters out there teaching school, working in hospitals, in different places. Uh, and because they wore habits, you saw them, you recognized them. Some sisters who do wear a habit, they'll say, well, they want to stand out, and they want to be known as a sister. I want to be known as a, as a person following Christ. And I'm a Benedictine sister, and I love Benedictine spirituality, and I hope they know me that way. A common misconception by some is that sisters blindly follow everything that the Catholic Church says. The Sisters of St. Mary Monastery in Rock Island, Illinois, is a community that holds some liberal opinions on controversial topics. As far as the homosexual uh, question, you know, I think we've learned so much on human psyche and on emotional development, psychological development, physical development, that, you know, who are we to judge that a gay person is wrong? The same goes with people who are divorced and remarried. You know, um, mistakes are made. Love is lost, love is gained, and love is and later found that it really wasn't 
that kind of love, that, that sturdy of a love. And so we have to find a way to embrace what doesn't work and say, that's okay. And you're welcome in our church. The Catholic Church does not allow sisters to marry or have children. This can be hard for some women entering a religious community, but is not always an obstacle in their decision to choose this lifestyle. This challenges the definition of family as these sisters form their own meaning of the word. For me, I think I'm lucky being a teacher. You know, you always wonder what it would be like to have a child of your own and everything else. And then I always view, I mean, every one of my students is mine. That's just it. You know, I get kids who ask me, oh, aren't you ever going to have kids? And I said, oh, no, I don't need to have kids. I have all of you. I think that helps you know, at those moments, and I think every religious woman probably will express, you know, oh, what would have it been like? I don't feel like I've had to sacrifice, like, suffer, or it's so hard. I really had to sacrifice a lot of things to do this. I, I don't feel that way about religious life. There are options. We all have options. You choose to be married. You choose not to. You choose to have kids. You choose not to. You know, you think people think of dreams. You know, I thought I'd be married and have kids. My mom was married and had kids. My sisters were going with people, were engaged, getting married. Well, I wasn't part of that. Uh, some of my friends were married, having kids, but I had other friends that were single, like me. But still, I just didn't, I still felt like there was something missing. One aspect to community life is these sisters are always surrounded by people that love them. They share their lives together, and just like any family, not everything is perfect. These sisters learn to grow with each other despite the conflicts that living in close quarters can cause. What it is in terms of community is an intentional choosing to come together, to live together um, with a common purpose and that is to love and to serve the Lord um, and to be women of, of, of prayer and um, model um, the Christ life. Now having said that wonderful ideal uh, concept, that does not mean that um, there aren't times when I would just love to wring Sister Kunigunda's neck, you know, whoever Kunigunda is. Um, but the call uh, brings with it, I think, grace. You know, we have good times. We have popcorn and you get giggly and laughing like everybody else. And, you know, you have your times too when you're not necessarily, someone's driving you up the wall and, okay, I've lived with this person. I got to figure out, you know, how we can get around whatever is happening and move on. And, but I think that's like in any family is you have those moments. And I think sometimes in those moments where things aren't always going so smoothly is when you're really also rubbing off some of the rough spots in your own personality and your own flaws that you may have. It can be difficult living with a big group of women. And you know, you're, there are many personalities, of course, that we all gel together and then there's some that rub, we rub each other the wrong way and that's part of the human commitment that we make to one another. Sometimes I think to myself, how did I get here? And I look at some of the sisters that I'm living with and I think, I would not have chosen her as a mediocre friend on a really good day, and yet I've put all my eggs in the same basket with her. And that's, um, that's a gift. That's a grace of, of, of God. I've been very fortunate to have wonderful friends and community, and I'm very fortunate that I get along with different age groups. So many of the sisters might be older than me, but um, we're very much peers. And we're probably my better friends and community are young at heart. Probably the biggest challenge for me, because I am the youngest in community by 13 years is 
I'm probably the only one who listens to the music I listen to, um, you know, um, those type of things. Although I have a few TV shows, I have hooked a few sisters. I got Sister Catherine Clary watching The Big Bang Theory. So, <laughs> so you know, so we share, you know, and, you know, I'm conscious of, okay, you know, they're not really going to want to listen to Bon Jovi or Lady Gaga or whoever that I like to listen to. Vatican II also gave women more power in the church. Women were given more options to share their love of Christ without necessarily devoting their lives to the church. We could be lectors, we could be Eucharistic ministers, you know, we could be religious ed directors, so forth and so on, where those jobs and those ministries weren't available to women at the time. So I think because if there was a woman who wanted to do something for the church, besides being, you know, in charge of the woman's group, whatever it was called at the time, I mean, religious life was about the only other option. It's very countercultural today to be entering religious life, but I think young women are taking the time to find out what life is about. With the changes brought on by Vatican II, women have gained more of a voice in the church. However, they are still limited on what they are able to do. Since Pope Francis was appointed a year ago, he has brought hope for a change to these sisters that they may finally be given equal power as their male counterparts. Cardinals, bishops, those in positions of authority um, view it from uh, a clerical authoritarian uh, mode um, in which they ultimately have the final say. And so it's, it's from uh, a, a male perspective and um, not always with a very clear understanding of what the average person goes through in life. And so, yes, I would like to see that change in the church. There may be a type of religious community that married people with children can join and pray and work together, but still maintain that balance and time they need with their family. I think we need to look at how the best person can be the priest. The central act of our church is through our seven sacraments. And right now they are limited to a celibate male uh, being able to administer the sacraments. And I and see possible, possible ways that that could be expanded, like a hospital chaplain might be able to do the sacrament of anointing. I would, I've given retreats and heard people's confessions, literally, but I can't give them a sacramental blessing. And I've often said I think, I most definitely believe that they'll be married priests before women priests. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with woman priests. I know as a re religious woman myself, I think a lot of people just automatically assume that if that was an option, we'd all become priests, and I don't think that's true at all, <laughs> because I wouldn't. Though sisters may not get everything they want, they understand that God will grant them what they need. Through every bump in the road, they count on each other and their faith to help them through. Many people change careers, locations, and question their commitments, but these women have committed their lives to their community and wouldn't change a thing. I chose to be a Catholic sister. You've chosen to be married. We can live good lives either way. Not one is not better than the other. That's what the world needs more of. We're, we're very human. Uh, we make big time mistakes just like everybody else. And we struggle from day to day, um, you know, to do what we know is right and good. I think you know, as we live together, hopefully we all are making each other better um, people, better followers of Jesus, strengthening our relationship with each other as well as with God. The one um, thing that we have, I guess, that, that helps us along is our life of prayer. Um, and so we've always got the grace of God kind of there with us. You know, God has a plan never to harm us, but we just have to wait for that plan to unfold. <laughs>